dive deeply into the weeds of international taxation on just one aspect of it. But before doing that, let me say that if uh, Bernie Sanders is elected president, which probably only he thinks he will be, uh, you know, this, uh, his view on, on taxation is pretty strong, and he will no doubt totally embrace BEPS and go beyond what's in BEPS. If Donald Trump is elected uh, president, he has um, told us that he wants a 15% corporate rate, which would, if enacted, our current corporate federal corporate rate is 35%. If enacted, would erase much of the problem uh, that comes from the uh, differences between the worldwide U.S. semi-worldwide tax system and the foreign uh, almost universal territorial systems. Now, if Clinton is elected, then, you know, it'll be more in the middle of these two extremes. And uh, so I guess the predicate of these remarks is that uh, Clinton will be elected. But, <laughs> uh, because otherwise it'd be a completely different <laughs> outlook on, <clears throat> on, on uh, the whole tax system. Uh, before we get to this interesting slide, let me uh, mention in two ways thinking about the international economic system has dramatically changed since I was a graduate student. At that time, uh, we did have a fixed exchange rate world the old Bep and Bret Wood system. And the leading intellectual thinkers who were Milton Friedman and um, James Mead at the time, they held the belief, and it was widely believed when we had the Smithsonian Agreement of 1971, that um, if you have a floating exchange rate regime, the rates would float so that the current account balances were roughly zero over the cycle. In other words, you would not have a country with persistent large trade deficits or persistent large trade surpluses. They would balance. Uh, this ignored the role of capital flows, and we now know, this is quite a few years later, more than 40 years later, that that is now the world works. The exchange rates do not move in a way that ensures current account balance um, for countries. And that is one reason why in the TPP uh, there's an attempt to have a currency side letter. I mean, currency is moving into trade. But uh, if we do get currency into the trade field, which is a big fight about that, Taxes are just around the corner, and as Steve said at the beginning, uh, the WTO has put its toe in the tax field, not very deeply. But if currency differences can affect trade, which they clearly do, so can tax differences. So that's kind of a big background, but I, I want to emphasize why this is so important for the United States. Uh, we are essentially a intellectual uh, country in terms of our corporate citizens, our, many of our leading corporate citizens, which is <clears throat> underscored by this fact. If you look at the valuation of S&P 500 corporations, these are the large multinationals, more than half on average is attributable to intellectual property. It's not something you can pick up and measure. It's not plant equipment. It's their, what they built into their whole system. And that's true of Starbucks. You might not think that, but it's an amazing company in terms of their, uh, what they've designed for serving coffee all over the world, as well as, of course, for Apple. Well, intellectual property to create that is tremendously expensive. I mean, that's half the value. It's more for a company like Apple's three quarters, four fifths of the value. If our companies are taxed uh, much higher than companies based in the Netherlands or Canada or France or whatever on their international income, 
which is the case today, if the worldwide system is actually imposed. In other words, if we get rid of deferral, as uh, uh, Wayne mentioned, our companies, US-based multinationals, would be at a big disadvantage in this game of developing new products, uh, new concepts, and selling them worldwide. So that's why it's so important for the U.S. And I don't see any conceivable exchange rate adjustment which takes care of that. <clears throat> so my second big point before turning to this interesting chart is that why are corporate taxes so popular? I don't know, probably everybody here has studied a little bit about taxation can hardly escape it. But if you study it very much, you, one would probably know that nearly all economists who have studied corporate taxation, including the OECD, think it's the worst possible tax in terms of major tax forms, in terms of depressing growth, inhibiting growth. It has a lot of bad properties. So why is it then so popular? Well, and good old Senator Russell Long said it all when I was when I just came to Washington in the 70s, in the 60s actually. Don't tax you, don't tax me, tax the fellow behind the tree. So corporate taxes, you know, most people don't know how they affect them. They don't think they affect them at all. If somebody else is paying, Bernie Sanders completely believes that. So that you know you can tax the Apple or GE or all these other companies listed there. To whatever you want to charge, it's not going to make any difference. And that is a very strong, powerful argument which has kept the corporate tax rate in the U.S. as high as it is. In smaller countries, which nearly every other country in economic terms is smaller, there's a greater recognition that, hey, this makes a difference. So, as Warren said, the U.S. is out of step. Arguably, we are out of step. And nearly every other country of any size has gone to a territorial system. And the countries which haven't have much lower tax rates than we do. Ireland has a nominal worldwide system. Its corporate tax rate is 12%. Chile has a nominal worldwide system. Its corporate tax rate, I believe, is 15%. But, but Japan, which has a high corporate tax rate nominally, has gone to a territorial system, and I mentioned, of course, France. Canada, which has a federal rate of 16%, has gone to a, uh, a territorial system, and so on. So we're out of step on, on rates, dramatically out of step, which means any company headquartered in any, almost any other country, and there are a lot of good countries to put your headquarters in, can have its subsidiaries around the world, which are not taxed by the headquarters of the country. Now, turning to the charts, I have a couple of charts on why kind of this really matters today. This is the first one. This is trade as a percent of GDP, <coughs> of world GDP. And we have now had the longest period in the post-war period, I took it back to 1950 to 45, that's still be true, of no increase in the trade to GDP ratio. Why does that count? Well, lots of econometrics shows that increasing trade to GDP is really good for growth. It's a real driver of economic growth. And no country which has done well has, has not increased this ratio. Well, worldwide now, the ratio is pretty flat. And one reason, I think, is we, not, we have not had any trade liberalization on a global scale for 20 years since the Euro 